Check it out. I think I found Ursa Major. Ursa Major or Big Dipper? Does it matter which term you use? Is there a rule? That is the goal of uh, today with you. The Ursa Major or Big Dipper section here in the middle. The question here, explain the difference between a constellation and an asterism. Well, this is actually the first time in the astronomy course I've actually used the term constellation. You probably haven't attended to the fact that I've avoided using the word constellation, and throughout the trimester I've pretty much said star pattern instead of the term constellation. There have been times when you've seen on the presentations the word constellations, but uh, remember this bad joke? The uh, time I read it in class, I'd read it, tell me more about the star patterns of yours. And the reason for this conscientious choice to avoid saying constellation is because there is actually a very specific definition in the world of astronomy for the term constellation. It has to do with our celestial globe. You'll recall the celestial globe represents the Earth on the inside. The Earth has a geographic north pole, so a celestial north pole. We extend the geographic south pole to the celestial south pole. The Earth's equator we extend out and call the celestial equator. What we would think of as celestial latitude, our right ascension. And what we think of as celestial longitude are your declination or lines of declination. So the celestial glow can be very helpful in point, pinpointing specific stellar locations, but also is good to point out areas or sections of the night sky. You may not have been aware, but there is a governing body of astronomy. It's the IAU, the International Astronomical Union, established in 1919. It's a group of people who have PhDs in astronomy. They'll meet annually. I think the membership is about 13,000 or so currently. And the things that these uh, individuals will meet, discuss, and vote on are things such as naming of celestial bodies. And you'll see in 1928 they gathered, and one of the items on their agenda was to establish various sections of the celestial model, or celestial sphere. So what they did was got together and established that the celestial sphere would be broken up into 88 sections. And that is actually what the formal definition of a constellation is. A constellation is one of the 88 sections of the night sky. Now, the IAU being aware that the stories of the zodiac are very prominent across cultures on our planet, they made sure to pick areas of the night sky and map them out and designate them official areas of the night sky by looking at those 12 zodiac star patterns and encompassing one of those in uh, 12 of the 88 sections of the night sky we now know are called constellations. The problem we've mentioned before, when you take a three-dimensional sphere and try and flatten it into a more user-friendly carry-with-you map, you uh, have this distortion that occurs. Now, even without the distortion, looking at the 88 individual constellations, they're kind of crazy shapes. They're not nice squares or rectangles or triangles. They're very odd shapes, largely because the IAU did want to incorporate those 12 major star patterns of the zodiac into constellations. And so we'll show you this next picture here, which is the flattened out version of the 88 sections of the night sky. It's crazy. The 12 zodiac star patterns run along here. So you'll see Libra, Virgo, Leo, and uh, it's a mess. It's crazy because the astronomers were trying to take in all of Libra, all of Scorpio, and then kind of patched in the rest of the major star patterns that had stories and readily visible in the night sky. The 12 star patterns we began the astronomy course with, the zodiac, the dot to dot guessing we did, that uh, these represent star patterns 
as constellations, being areas of the night sky, and star patterns, the stories of Pisces, the stories of Castor and Pollux, the stories of Sagittarius. Those stories, those images are saying that you see some sort of shape. Those are what are called asterisms. So your whole life, what you've probably been saying constellation for, is really an asterism. An asterism is an arbitrary, made-up pattern from the stars. So a constellation, one of the 88 sections of the night sky, whereas an asterism is an arbitrary, meaning made-up pattern with the stars, with the dots in the night sky kind of like tissue and Kleenex. Kleenex is a very specific brand name. Constellation has a very specific meaning, one of the 88 sections of the night sky. Tissue, the generic term, tissue, asterism. So when do we say Big Dipper or Ursa Major? Well, first thing to be aware of that in astronomy, we don't heart things, we scope things. So when we're looking through our telescopes, we're not so much looking for asterisms. We're really looking for regions or sections of the night sky. And here is the star pattern of the Big Dipper. You might recognize in here. Oh, let's go back, change it to the pen here instead of changing the slides. So this is the Big Dipper pattern, quite familiar with. But what I want to draw your attention to is this darker blue section. So if I just outline this here quickly and quite haphazardly and messily, the outline where this darker blue is, that is the constellation. And the constellation is called Ursa Major. This star pattern that some cultures will look at and call it the Big Dipper, and in a few moments, we'll look at some other cultural stories and names for this asterism of the Big Dipper. On the page, what's highlighted down here, this black blob on the page, that is your actual constellation of Ursa Major. So a constellation is what you're looking at here right now. A constellation isn't that pattern of stars that we've generally been thinking your whole life is a very particular term. Since you're taking an astronomy class, we have to make sure you're aware that uh, the term constellation is actually a defined uh, word. So this is the constellation of Ursa Major. And within Ursa Major, this area here, you have the asterism. You have the star pattern commonly known as the Big Dipper common story from Greek mythology is that the Big Dipper was really representative of the tail end of a bear. And I'm not sure about you, but the images I've grown up seeing of bears, because I've not actually seen a bear, the bears don't have these long tails. And uh, the Greek mythology goes that uh, Zeus was protecting I think it was Callisto and her son, and they were about to attack each other, not being aware they were mother and son. So he picked them up, turning them into bears, and swinging them to cast them into the night sky for protection. And it was that swinging them by their tails that extended their tails, so that it's the bear in some mythologies. The Brits, they call it the plow. So if you're an avid reader and you enjoy the works of J.R. Tolkien and you've read um, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you may have stumbled as you were reading and a reference was made to the Great Plow, and you probably would think farming implement, and you would think down when actually plow is a reference to the sky, to looking up. In uh, France, the uh, folks will see it more as the saucepan, or saucepan. The ancient Maya, they called it a parrot, named it Seven Macaw. Uh, ancient Chinese thought of it as a special chariot for the Emperor of the Heavens. And then we'll give you a mythology a little bit closer to our own continent. 
where this incorporates not just the Big Dipper asterism, but also the asterism of the Northern Crown. And this story is uh, depicted with the bear here, and then these three following stars. So this would be the bear and the three following stars here. So the legend here is that late one spring, a bear woke up from its long winter sleep and wandered out of its rocky hillside den, which is the northern crown. In the spring, the crown is above the dipper, so the bear moves down. It was very hungry after its long sleep, so it walked here and there looking for food. Soon, three hunters spotted the bear and started chasing it. Just like the bear, all the hunters were hungry after the long cold winter. The first hunter carried a bow and arrow to kill the bear. The second one carried a pot to cook the bear in, and the third hunter tagged along behind the others, collecting wood for the fire that they would make so they could cook the bear. Which person would you like to be? Would you be like the one that carries the pot, collects the kindling, has the bow and arrow? All summer, the hunters chased the bear through the sky. In fall, the bear started to get weak, and the first hunter shot it with an arrow. The arrow killed the bear, and it fell over on its back. Blood fell out of the sky from the dead bear and splashed over the leaves of the maples, sumacs, and other trees. And that's why we see brilliant red leaves on, the sum, on some trees in the fall. The hunters ate the bear and left its skeleton behind. As fall turned to winter, the weather became colder and colder, and the bear's skeleton was still visible in the sky. But the life spared of the bear had entered a new body, the body of another sleeping bear. All through the long cold winter, the bear slept. When spring came around again, the bear woke up and lumbered out of its den to search for food. Once again, it was uh, hunted and killed, and its life spirit entered the body of another sleeping bear in the den, and so it happens every year. So one of my favorite stories of the uh, star pattern asterism of the Big Dipper with the Northern Crown is I like that explanation of why the leaves will change in the fall. It's the blood dripping down from the slain bear. So that repetition as the stars rotate throughout the year. So you get to play the wonderful game. Where is the asterism of the Big Dipper? You are correct. It is right there. That's where you were thinking, I'm certain. Here's another. It's right there. So the asterism is here within the big section of night sky we refer to as Ursa Major. So asterisms, you can draw and interpret them any way you want. That's why it was perfectly fine that H.A. Uh, Ray, the author of Curious George, where he, in his star, the stars book, he would render the star patterns, the asterism, just a little bit differently to try and make them look more like their names. So how you interpret, how you perceive the stars, that's entirely up to you. You can't change the names of the constellation. Bearing that in mind, let's think about this. Well, here's a good idea. We can have a star named after my mother for only $39.95. Do you think it's legit? Oh, yeah. I'm sure astronomers generations from now will be referring to some star out there as fluorine. Similarly, today I see Sirius, Alpha Centauri, and oh, Bob Crabstein's big bop and ball of gas. The reality of the Biostar program. Perhaps you've heard of these Biostar programs, and the question, of course, is it legit? And the answer is yes and no. It's uh, whether we're thinking in terms of asterisms, constellations, IAU, you may not be aware, but you could also uh, purchase a Mars Crater for yourself. If that's not enough, you could buy some lunar property, Venus, uh, Mercury, Io, it's one of the moons in our solar system of Jupiter. So can you actually buy a star? fascinating concept. When you purchase a star from, let's just use the phrase buy a star as a company, when you purchase a star from there, what you're agreeing and what you're paying for is probably like $79.95 these days. What you're paying for is an agreement between you and that buy a star company that in their catalog they will publish this star name, whatever you want it to be. 
Smith's Astronomy of the Universe class. Within that company, it will always be referred to, that right ascension declination for that star, be referred to Smith's Astronomy of the Universe star. You are not, however, going to have the IAU meet in the summer, consult with the Biostar programs, and change the names in the official astronomical naming and renderings. So you would never look on an internet source at right ascension declination that we had been assigned by the Biostar company and pull it up and see that the world would have to call it Smith Astronomy the Universe Star. Uh, it's more of a sentimental type of a thing to buy a star, present it to someone as a gift, a nice gesture. Several years ago I had a student come in to an astronomy class. They approached a student and uh, gifted them a star as an imitation to a school dance. And uh, when someone presents you with a star that they've named after you, how do you say no to that gesture when asked to a dance? No, that's how you say no. But uh, she did in fact say yes and they went and had a great time. All right, so the concept of perspective is something that we always, 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 always throw out for you to consider in Astronomy Universe. And here's one of those prime examples. See the guy in the third cubicle on the left? Adam named after you. I wonder how many times each of us have been named over by various uh, celestial bodies out there. So way back at the beginning of the trimester, there was some frustration as we put those dots out for you to guess. Three dots at Aries. How on earth do you see a ram there? How on earth do you see a centaur in those dot patterns? And so occasionally we have activities where we'll have folks draw a more modernized representation. So perhaps not Gemini the twins or symbols of friendship, but maybe a smart device. Rather than Taurus the Bull Classical, we have ourselves uh, an electric guitar. Not Leo the Lion, perhaps a motorized bike here. So, always interesting to consider, do you like the classics? Do you like the more modern renderings? And when I have students vote in class, it always surprises me how the majority is, you like the classics. Which is probably why the classics are the classics and stick around. And we'll continue to teach those 12 classic Greek uh, zodiac symbols. As I mentioned, Ray, we showed you some renderings. This is Ray's rendering of the Great Bear, Ursa Major. And Ray is free to make the asterisms and interpret them however you want, just as you are. But you would never have the IAU uh, change the name of Ursa Major to something else. So just a little wrap up here for you. We have Pisces. This right there is the asterism, where we recognize the classic two fish depiction, but the constellation itself of Pisces is this section or area of the night sky. So that's the constellation of Pisces where the asterism is within the constellation of Pisces. Clear as a bell with all those red markings. This is Cancer, upside down Y we try to recall that's the asterism the star pattern of cancer where this block section represents the constellation of cancer last one to look at here is orion the great hunter this is the asterism that is within the constellation of orion